welcome to my sewing room. We have such an exciting show for you today and the main theme is Australian window pane. A number of years ago when I was in Sydney in the Queen Victorian Queen Victoria building, I found a purchase blouse that had the most beautiful technique on it. You could see through part of it. It had a beautiful uh, uh, zigzag that went around it, a beautiful satin stitch that went around it. And I looked at it and I thought, well, I just think it looks like a window pane because I can see through it. And so I decided to call it Australian window pane. And so we brought the blouse home. Let me just show you this beautiful christening dress. This Australian window pane is the sign of the Holy Spirit done shaped inside this leaf with the curving. But isn't that a pretty way to use Australian window pane? It's a very versatile stitch. You can make almost any pattern you like out of it. This is a really interesting garment. I like to use this a little pinafore uh, made out of a batiste over a nightgown so you can use it sort of as a house coat. All of this technique right here is Australian window pane. Absolutely elegant and really very easy to do. Now Australian window pane doesn't have to be on white fabric. Here is a beautiful ladies dress on a print and this beautiful Australian window pane iris on the collar with the purple flower and the green leaves and the yellow centers and you can see through it. That's what is why it's called Australian window pane. You can even have a very sophisticated ladies blouse. Do you see the Australian window pane? Let me put my hand in there. These wonderful techniques on this cotton batiste black blouse. Australian window pane, as I said, is very easy to do. Come on over to the technique boards with me and I'll share with you just how easy it is. I'd like to share with you how to do both an Australian window pane heart and a flower. First of all, trace the heart off onto a piece of organdy. Then place the organdy, a piece of water soluble stabilizer, and your base fabric. In other words, make a sandwich. Now stitch using a tiny, tiny zigzag all the way around the heart. Stitch length one, stitch width one. The next step is to trim away the organdy from around the outside of the heart. Just come in here real closely to the zigzagging and trim it away. Then I turn the whole thing over to the back. This is the back side where the fabric is still there. I make a little slit and I trim the back of the heart out. Having the water soluble stabilizer in there makes it a lot easier to trim without cutting the front organdy. After that is cut away, I will come back and do a tight zigzag or a satin stitch through all the layers. I also have another piece of water soluble stabilizer on top. Now you don't have to put it on top, but it just makes it easier. Then I go cut away my water soluble stabilizer and your Australian window pane heart is now finished. Let's do a flower. It's a little bit different uh, design. Trace your flower onto the organdy. Put your organdy trace flower and your water soluble stabilizer and we've used silk dupioni for this flower. Now I'm going to come next and just simply teeny teeny zigzag all the way around it and the little center dots and the center of the flower. Next, you're going to tr cut away the outside of the organdy. Also cut away the organdy on the little dots, the inside, and cut away the organdy on the center of the flower. And then, do you remember what we did next to make it peekaboo? Went to the back, trimmed away all of the green silk dupioni to make it peekaboo. And then the final step is to come in and zigzag around it doing your applique stitch. And the final Australian window pane flower is absolutely beautiful. Here is the final flower. Now, I have invited my very dear friend and business colleague, Louise Bayer, to join me on the show today. <laughs> Louise is one of the world's most outstanding sewing machine artists. Louise, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. Um, I just wanted to show a little bit, again, uh, talk a little bit about the flower uh, design that we had because it is a little bit different than just a plain design like the heart is uh -huh. because it has some inside lines. Now on this one, just like Martha said, you trace the design onto the organdy and then you sandwich it between a layer of salvi and the silk dupioni. Now um, something that really is helpful when you're doing something like this is to use a temporary spray adhesive and kind of glue everything together and that will make it uh, stay together without shifting at all. Okay, the next step would be again to 
go all the way on your design lines with a tiny open zigzag. Now it's really important here to notice that I didn't go on the inside design lines at all. It's only the very outside edge as well as the little circles that is in the center of the flower. Okay, now on this one I've already stitched and I've started to trim, trim the organdy from the outside and then you trim the back uh, side where the um, silk du peony is so that you have your window pane effect. Okay, now next thing is to do that satin stitch. And the satin stitch, just like in any time you do any applique, you want to work background to foreground. So in looking at this flower, um, I've got the petals, the way that the petals are done, this petal needs to be stitched here before this one, but uh, or rather, this petal needs to be stitched, but before I go all the way down to the end of that, I really need to do a little part of this one okay. because of the way that it's done. So I'm just going to start right here where I'm almost going to be finished with this. Uh, make believe I have already finished with this satin stitch. And I'm sorry, I, I put a... It's going You've to. You've got a satin stitch. <laughs> yeah, I've got a satin stitch. I'm going to lengthen my stitch just a tad so that it'll feed a little bit easier. I had shortened it a little bit too much. Now again, before I go to finish this last row of stitching here, what I'm going to do is lift my foot, pull and adjust it so that I can satin stitch right along here. And then when I move it over again, I'm ready. It makes it look as if I stitched over that final edge. And a neat trick to do here instead of tying it off is to go from a wide or whatever your width is to a zero width. And you do that by just stitching uh, using your uh, width button and going down to zero. And it is, because it goes down to a zero width, it gets a real tiny stitch and it's almost like a tie off stitch. Okay, now you just raise your needle and we're ready to come back around and again just pick up where we left off here to do the satin stitch again. Louise, that's so fascinating. I always love to watch you do applique. I don't think anybody in the world does applique as well as you do. Mm -hmm. But that's fascinating the way mm -hmm. you took it down and just decreased it where it looked like just a, a little expert point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now I'd like to share a home decorating project with you. I have a beautiful Australian window pane pillow for you. This pillow is made of a gold silk dupioni. It has the beautiful design that you've just seen Louise stitch out for you and this wonderful fringe from the real home decorating department that makes it so sophisticated looking. Now, how do you finish this pillow off? First of all, do your Australian window pane and then to make this silk dupioni really smooth, we did two things. First of all, using our spray adhesive, we put a lining behind it, and then there is some a little thin layer of batting. And all of that makes the pillow really smooth. And the reason I lined it was so you wouldn't see the batting through the Australian window pane. I'm going to finish this pillow by putting two layers of trim. One is this beautiful wide fringe, and then on top of that fringe, I'm going to later stitch down just this little piece of braid. It's very simple to stitch the braid, the fringe on. I'm simply going to make a straight stitch. I guess I'll use my little stick to hold the little fringes out there. Simply using a straight stitch, I'm going to stitch on my braid all the way over. Just kind of hang on to it and be sure you keep it straight. You could even use the spray adhesive for this too. That would be good, wouldn't it? I'm going to stitch right along, getting my braid on there. And then after I get the braid on, I'm going to go back, after I get the fringe, I'm sorry. After I get the fringe on, I'm going to go back and do one more layer of stitching and attach the braid. And then I will have finished one of the most elegant pillows using the Australian window pane and the beautiful silk dupioni and then the fringe and the braid. And next, we have something really special for you. Tips for fine baby wear. I'm 
so pleased to have as my guest today, Claudia Newton. Claudia is the editorial director of the Fancy Works section of So Beautiful magazine. Claudia, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. What we're going to talk about today is um, some pattern modifications that we can do to a um, front back buttoned day gown. We're going to move that opening to the front. We're going to add a, an inverted back pleat and we're going to add some front tucks so that when we finish with it we'll have front tucks here and we've got a little inverted pleat in the back. So what we would do first is to shorten our day gown and I've already done that and this is what my original pattern looked like. The area I'm concerned with, this is my back opening, and I want to take that back opening and transfer it to the front. So what I need to do is to remove everything from the center back over. So I'm going to make a strip like this. And this is what my modified back looks like. I'll now place that on the fold, and that will be my center back. Now to the front of it, the original one is placed on the fold and I want to add an opening to that. So the part that I remove from the back, I'm going to add to the front. When I do that, I want to line up the top edge and I have the buttonholes marked on here. So once I've added that to it, what I come out with is a piece that looks like this. So I've now added my overlap and my facings. You'll notice that this is not cut straight across. If it were, the facings wouldn't fit the curve of the neckline once they're folded in. So what we want to do is at this point we would fold the facings in and then trim out the neckline and when you open it out it looks like this. So that's my modified front. The other piece we have is our sleeve and we don't have to do anything to it. Now once we've got our new pieces, the first thing we're going to do is add the pleat to the back. I have a piece of fabric folded wrong sides together and what I've done is to mark this is my new pattern piece and I want to add a pleat. So what I've done is just taken a two inch ruler and drawn a line that will allow for the pleat. Now I place my pattern here. I want the pleat to stop about the fullest area of the armhole so I've marked that on here. Once you've marked it, you can trace it and cut it out. And what you're going to do at this point is to cut straight across the neck edge because there again, like our front facings, we want it to fit the neck curve after the pleat's put in. So what I do once I've got it cut, from the mark up, I stitch the seam. From the mark down, I baste the seam. That puts in my pleat. And the way to finish the pleat out is to open the piece. And at this point, let me get it straight here, I'm going to flatten the pleat so that the fold of the fabric meets the seam line behind there and I press it this way and it winds up looking like this. To hold it in there I've stay stitched across the top edge and at the point where you stopped the stitching if you will put a little decorative stitch there it kind of anchors it as well as making it pretty. And these are some examples. You want a stitch that starts stitching in the center with the needle on that seam. That way you'll have something symmetrical. And if you want to, you can even put a series of stitches that would come up toward the neck edge. Now we're almost finished with this part. All you have to do now is to place the pattern back on there, retrace the neckline, and it's generally a good idea to stay stitch before you cut that so that it doesn't stretch out of shape. And once you've got that, you can open up the pleat at this point if you want to, or you can wait until you get ready to hem it. But that finishes our back section. Oh, Claudia, that's fascinating. Well, now we're going to talk about adding tucks to the front. And what I have done is to take a piece of fabric on the selvage, and I place my pattern piece here, the way I'm going to cut it, and mark the center front at the neck edge and I also mark where I want my pleats to stop and there again it's at the fullest part of the arm before it enters that curve. You can play with a pleated piece of paper to decide on your spacing but what we've used here is three eighth inch tucks spaced one eighth inch apart and when you fold it all out that means that my lines had to be drawn five eighths of an inch apart. So what I did was decide where I want my first tuck in relation to center front I drew that on and then moved over five eighths of an inch for the others. This marks where I will stop the end of the tuck. The next thing you want to do is to press these tucks in. Just press a crease in there on the fold and if you want to you can press a crease where you're going to stop as well. 
Now, when you start to stitch these, if you back stitch, this is what it's going to look like. And I hope you can see the little mess down at the bottom. Even as careful as you are, that's going to show. So what I want you to do is to start stitching without tying it off. And it will just be stitched flat. And when you are finished with it, if you will thread each thread tail separately into a needle, and right at the bottom of that pleat, take it through just the single layer to the back so that it looks like this. And I've got my two tails there. This one I have already tied the knot in it. Then I rethread both tails through the needle and thread it through the inside of the tuck. And you can see on this one, that's already been done. If you look closely, you may be able to see the shadow. But you can see on this that we have a pretty ending. We don't have that little back stitch at the bottom. At this point, it's just like the back was. The next thing you're going to do is to place the pattern piece on here, trace around it, and when you've done that, you'll want to stay stitch at least the neck edge so that it won't, you know, stretch out on you. You can stretch, you can stay stitch the shoulder seams if you want, and at that point, you're ready to cut out and construct. So that's how simple it is to change the, the opening from one side to the other and to add your tucks and your back pleat. Claudia, I think this is the sweetest little baby coat. Thank you. And with two new grandbabies, I can really <laughs> see not only how sweet it would look, but it has the little sleeve. Right. And you know what I think would be beautiful is just to do a pretty little slip. Yes. Have this little day coat. This is a very classic that little children's it garment. Is. And Claudia, it is. thank you for and all the really wonderful easy. techniques. Thank you. And next, I have a beautiful Australian window pane doll dress to share with you. This is one of the most beautiful doll dresses that I think we've ever had on Martha's Sewing Room. Cecil Elizabeth is our little doll who is modeling this magnificent lavender Nalona doll dress. The neckline features a little gathered French uh, lace with the Swiss entredeau. Then this is Australian window pane up here in the neckline of the dress with a little machine embroidery. But don't you worry, I'm going to show you how you can still do Australian window pane even if you don't have an embroidery machine. Do you see the sweet little decorative trim that goes around the Australian window pane? A really nice touch. And the little dropped waist dress with the little built-in sash. Now come down. Oh, aren't these pretty? The little Australian window pane motifs. There are five motifs built in the front of the dress. I really love the way the bottom of this dress is finished, and in just a few minutes I'm going to show you exactly how to do that. That is a scalloped insertion with a gathered edging zigzag to it. Now this dress is not only beautiful on the front of the doll dress, I just have to take a, this opportunity to turn her around to the side and let you see that magnificent sleeve. I have to believe that this doll dress will win a prize in anybody's contest. Now, let me share with you how easy it is to do Australian window paint and make a beautiful doll dress like this. First of all, you certainly can embroider. If you have an embroidery machine, you can certainly embroider a little piece of embroidery. Also, if you have a, a handkerchief or whatever you want to use. As a matter of fact, if you had a collection of antique handkerchiefs, you could put a different handkerchief inset in each one of those Australian window panes and it would be beautiful. What if you don't have a fancy embroidery machine? No problem. Let me show you what you can do. You can simply just embroider on organdy this little decorative stitches. This is a straight stitch and little decorative flower. It is no problem for you to make something really pretty even if you don't have a fancy machine or if you don't want to cut up some of your old handkerchiefs or for that matter buy some new embroidered handkerchiefs. They're really not very expensive. Okay. To make the dress, you trace off the Australian window pane, the motif, and then for the scallop skirt, you go ahead and trace on your scallops. And I'm going to have to trace these little lines here because that will be when I miter lace. You know you have to put a pin at the bottom and a pin at the top. But you trace off your skirt first. Now, as you can see right here, I've already put in my Australian window pane, and I've, this time I've just used the little decorative stitches. If you don't have an embroidery machine, you still can do a beautiful Australian window pane. Now, let's refresh our memory one more time on curving the lace, because that's what we're going to do now. I'm going to curve the lace. Here we go. Curve. Now, how do we do a miter? Let's do that one more time. Pin at the bottom, pin at the top, Fold the lace tail back on itself, remove the bottom pin, 
and come around and begin to work again. And as you probably remember, there are gathering threads built into the laces. And when I reach in there and pull that gathering thread, it lays down perfectly. Now, how do I sew the gathered lace edging onto the bottom? First of all, as you can see, I sew it every bit on the bottom before I trim away the fabric. All right, let me just share with you how I'm gonna do this. Do you see here that I've got the fabric edge still attached? Now, I have, I'm going to use a wing needle entredose stitch on this to attach the gathered lace, but you don't have to. You can simply, you can simply use a zigzag. Now, I'm certainly going to use my shish kebab stick to hold this gathered lace. And I'm going to sew straight as long as I can rather than trying to wiggle around a little bit. And then when I get to the point where I'm going to need to adjust the lace again, I use my needle down position, raise the presser foot, and I'm going to get it veered in another direction. And I am using the wing needle entredeau to attach the gathered lace. And I certainly am using my shish kebab stick. It's really pretty easy to do once you get the swing of it. Just simply stitch along, watch where you're going, push up a few more gathers. And I'm using wing needle entredeau, but you can just use a zigzag. It is not a problem to use a zigzag. Now then, I'm gonna stitch all the way around there, of course. And then after that, I'm going to bring my fabric over here. Now, as you can see, I've got the gathered edge, lace edge stitched on there. All I do then, and by the way, I did use stabilizer. All I do then is lift it up and come in here and I'll just trim it away. And all of a sudden I have a beautiful scalloped edge skirt. Let me just show you how pretty that's gonna be with all the little strings hanging down and all. See how pretty that is, it's pretty easy too. And now I would like to invite you to come along to my attic. I have a perfectly beautiful slip, oh, about 1920 to 1930, somewhere in that era, that I purchased at Portobello Road in London. Now, let me share with you some of the exciting details. Of course, it's done out of white batiste. I think nearly everything I own is almost out of white batiste. The slip straps are beautiful, and they'd be great on the lingerie we have featured in this series, too. There's a straight strip of fabric in the middle, flat insertion on, excuse me, flat edging on one side, flat edging on the other side. What an easy little slip to make with just the uh, lace across the front. Now look at the beautiful motifs. There are three motifs in the front of the slip. Absolutely beautiful lace. I think maybe those are English motifs. And then coming on down the slip, you know what, I bet you could see it easier if I picked it up here. Coming on down on the slip, there is this absolutely beautiful lace beading, which would carry a pretty wide ribbon. Absolutely beautiful. By the way, do you know in England they call that ribbon slot? And now the interesting, interesting skirt, which has mitering. And this is a motif, a lace motif, which has been stitched down. And by the way, they only had straight stitch sewing machines back then. So even if you just have a straight stitch sewing machine, you can still make beautiful garments like this. And would you look at this beautiful lace on the bottom. I'm not even sure that lace like that, even in France, is made that pretty anymore. Isn't that gorgeous? The details on this little slip are so perfect. You know, if you have just started or even are thinking about starting a, a vintage clothing collection, I'll tell you a little secret. Go to the flea markets or go in the backs of some of the uh, antique stores. And I don't go to real antique stores. I kind of like to go to malls or places where I know I can get a good buy. Even though nothing is really inexpensive anymore, sometimes you can get a piece that has a tear or rip and you can repair it. Or sometimes you can get a piece that's really dirty and you can clean it up and do a little bit of repair. And that's the way I usually get most of my things because I really don't go to the, to the really, really vintage stores where they've already done all of that and put the high price. I like to shop for bargains. I really appreciate your coming uh, to my sewing room today and joining me. I've had a wonderful time sharing Australian window pane with you, and, and I, my, my guests have had a wonderful time sharing other things with you also. Thank you so much for your support, and I'd like to invite you to come back next time.